Um, and, uh, and, and I think this is a very, you know, so, so there's this weird kind of general worldview thing that somehow happened in the, in, in the 20th century, I think, um, that sort of imagines that somehow religion is inherently the enemy of science. And that if you detect it anywhere, right, you've got to get rid of it or stamp it out or put it in some other class, you, you know. Um, and, and the thing that's, re that's amazing, if you actually read the final judgment uh, in that case in Pennsylvania, was there was basically this idea that, um, well, you know, science and religion, you know, religion needs to be taught in public schools too, right? Um, but they need to be taught in their own classes. And so you start to, the, the rhetoric starts to, if you're an American, it starts to sound like uh, the separate but equal doctrine with regard to races in the United States, right? That you don't really want integration between the blacks and the whites, right? Uh, you know, so once you, you know, so you, so you imagine a situation where legally you freed the slaves. So in a sense, the, f the slaves are officially equal to the whites, okay? But then the question is, how do you enact equality? All right, and of course, there was this whole situation from the 1860s until the 1960s, the Civil Rights Act, right, in the United States, um, where there was separate but equal, right? Where it was possible for states to mandate that as long as there were, you know, facilities that would be deemed equal, right, you could have blacks and whites go in different places, different water fountains even, you know, different buses, whatever, okay? And it seems to me that this is kind of the attitude that these courts are taking with regard to science and religion. Of course religion needs to be taught, but not in science. Okay, regardless of the impact that religion has had in science, right? There's some presupposition that religion is somehow bad for science, right? We don't say that about other things, right, that often get brought into science classes. But we say this specifically about religion, right? And that's the problem, right? If we were like hyper scrupulous and say, well, you know, in a science class, all you should know are data points and equations, Cool, okay, let's go for that. But that's not what they're saying. They're, the religion is being specifically targeted here. Right, we don't have a Supreme Court case that says, separate science from politics. We have science, we have religion separated from science. Now that's interesting, okay? That's interesting and it's a little weird. Especially given, you know, that in fact religion has had a very powerful impact on the development of science. Okay, uh, and often the people who were so motivated to do that, you know, were people who were reading the Bible, trying to make sense of it. I mean, it wasn't these people were Buddhists, they weren't Hindus, right? They were people who are, in some sense, the predecessors of the people whose views are being excluded today. That's weird. Okay, that's very weird. Okay, now I make, I make the point this way because sometimes people think that I'm making some kind of relativist argument here, like, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom, you know, have like Hindu science in the classroom and, you know, whatever, you know. Uh, I'm not saying that at all. I actually think there's a specific positive benefit to having, right, the, the, the Abrahamic faiths represented in some way in science, okay? I, I wouldn't force feed it, but I just, it seems to me it has had a positive impact and there should be no reason why it should be ruled out, okay? And I do think, you know, as you see, you know, when these discussions do happen in the public forum, there is this tendency uh, to mix up all kinds of issues, right? So you talk about all the horrible things that have happened because of religion, right? The Christopher Hitchens thing, you know? Oh my God, you know, you know, I mean, but then, of course, you know, you didn't have an atomic bomb without science. And Hitler wouldn't have been able to do his worst without science, right? I mean, the point is, any form of knowledge or worldview that has access to, you know, technology, political power, economic resources, they can do all kinds of things. Okay? Uh, that goes without saying. You know, in that respect, everybody's got dirty hands. Right? You can't rule out religion uniquely on that basis, but nevertheless, there is this hang-up about religion. Okay? And I think this is a real, this is, this is a problem that I think, you know, you know, regardless of where you stand on this issue, this should bother you, right? Because, I mean, I have talked about in, in my own writings about what I see as kind of institutional bigotry against especially Abrahamic faiths, okay? Um, and, um, 
And I think that's real, okay? I think that's real. And, and I know the people who often promote this think they're enlightened, but it's complete bigotry, okay? At the end of the day, if we're talking about science, especially in the period that we live in now, one of the things that we need to do is motivate students to want to go into science, okay? Um, and people, are, you know, when people talk about this kind of issue, and this came up very much in the trial, um, when we're talking about science education, right, um, we're not merely talking about spoon-feeding students with the latest results from all the cutting-edge disciplines. That, that isn't really the point, okay? The point is to get people to think about, you know, to get, get them, uh, give them a sense of what it is to think scientifically and to understand that in a way that might be somewhat different from their taken for granted notions of how to think about the world and to realize and to get a sense of why this way of thinking about the world is important. Okay? To say that science is technical or specialist or something, of course it's that, but that doesn't quite capture why it's so important. Why people base so many decisions on the back of it. Okay? What is it about this knowledge? What, you know, why do we have this kind of knowledge, right? Um, and, and if you look at the history of science, one of the things that's very clear uh, is that there has been this drive that starts with the scientific revolution that human beings can get some kind of comprehensive understanding of reality that's rational. Okay? So in other words, science as a kind of project you know, whereby human beings can get a kind of comprehensive knowledge of reality, that motivation is dissipating and is being replaced by a rather kind of a fragmented kind of drive where certain areas of science are really flourishing, okay, uh, you know, so in biomedical sciences, for example, but without any serious kind of theoretical coverage. Okay, so in a sense, they could quite easily just be incorporated, you know, you could, you could easily take certain kinds of uh, biomedical science departments these days and just make them into R&D divisions of corporations and there wouldn't be anything lost. Okay, because they're not really, the, what, what's motivating them isn't really this drive towards some sort of ultimate understanding of reality, but rather, you know, being able to provide certain kinds of products for the clients who are paying for the research that's going on. Now, to be sure, all, there's always been that kind of issue going on in science, but the people who have been involved in it have also had this higher goal, and it's been one of the things that in the past has caused them to have problems with, their, with the people paying for them, right? These kinds of conflicts, of, you know, you might say, in sociology we talk about the idea of role ambivalence, right? The idea that, you know, you know people are paying you to do certain things, but you've been trained in a way to make you think that maybe you shouldn't be doing this, okay? Now the question is, where do you get that normative sensibility from? If the primary way in which you justify the pursuit of science is in terms of the customer always being right. Okay, where does the internal drive for science come from? Okay, now you might say, well, we're driving toward getting to the truth, getting to reality or whatever, but it, and, and, and that's good, that's fine. I have nothing against that, but one has to realize what's implied in that idea. Okay, um, because for example, if you were to go to you know China in its high period in the, in the ancient period in the ancient world, you get you know ch great developments in various forms of technology, architectural achievements, astronomical achievements, all kinds of things going on there. What you don't get though is a drive toward overarching theoretical unity, because basically at the, in the end of the day. The Chinese believe that what you know that sure there was a creator and that there was some kind of cosmic force that put it all together, but we don't have any privileged relationship to that form. Okay, we you know there's no sense of being created in the image and likeness. See, this is where we go back to the idea of the of the scientific revolution having to do with the mechanical worldview, where you imagine God as being the big engineer, right? Because God then, you know, is something that in some sense we could aspire to, right? Traditionally, our notions of scientific progress were predicated on the idea that God's got a design and we're trying to figure it out. And as it were, we can measure how closer we're getting to it because in a sense, God differs from us, not in kind, but by degree, right? The way God works is kind of how he, we work, but he works, he does it much, much better. And that's why it would make sense to actually come up with things like mathematical laws of nature and stuff like that, and to think, you know, you improve these things over time, because God is a big mathematician.